Good evening, everyone. And welcome to another exciting distinguished speaker series today. It's my honor and privilege to introduce to you all Mr. Omar Ishraq, the chairman and CEO of Medtronic, the world's leading medical technology company. When Mr. Ishraq joined Medtronic in 2011, he followed a 16 year career at GE, where he served as president and CEO of GE Healthcare Systems. And when he joined Medtronic, he was actually only one of two outsiders ever to become CEO of Medtronic. So it was amazing to be. One of his most impressive accomplishments was the acquisition of Providian, a $10 billion global manufacturer of surgical products and supplies. At that time, it was the largest medtech acquisition in the history of the industry. It was a pretty big deal. <laughs> Other amazing products that have come out under Mr. Ishraq's leadership include Mitra, the world's smallest pacemaker. It's literally the size of a vitamin pill. And the new Med 670G, the world's first artificial pancreas. Other than that, Mr. Ishbrock has always been methodical and purposeful, even in his younger days. During a break from his doctoral studies at King's College in England, Mr. Ishbrock decided to pitch hike across the US. But it wasn't just to see the sights. This man was on a mission. He had contacted every university electrical engineering department in the country with, a, and with an ultrasound unit in hopes of speaking with professors about his thesis, a copy of which he had in his backpack the whole time. <laughs> it's the same grit and ingenuity that has helped him lead the product to amazing organic growth and market success. So please, everyone, join me in welcome, giving a warm beautiful welcome to Mr. Omar Ishbak. Well, first, thank you for that very kind introduction. <laughs> so uh, it's wonderful to have you here. And uh, so I, I thought I would start with uh, focusing on this career journey you've had. And uh, you mentioned earlier today that, that you've, you've been in three or four, made three or four significant changes in, in terms of your career. As we think about the people in the audience, they're going to have to make choices about, do they stay, do they go, what, what opportunities do they, do they choose? And so every time you made a decision to move to a new firm, what, what thought process did you go through that, that led you to make those, those choices? Yeah, I, you know, I've, I think it's like three times I've moved in my whole career. Now, I've grown in, within those companies, but I've shifted companies relatively few times. And um, uh, the reasoning I went through each time was that I, I, for good or bad, I always had a sense of, uh, a longer term sense of purpose as to what I wanted to accomplish, which was not, you know, get to the next level of management or so, what difference did I want to make? And, um, and if I felt that this opportunity would give me a better chance to achieve that, I made the move. And uh, it wasn't, I was very leery about the grass is always greener and all this kind of stuff. So I thought through that very carefully. Uh, but uh, that, that is what made me move. And I can tell you, um, I, I did my PhD in, um, in ultrasound and electrical engineering and, and ultrasound technology for imaging. And at that time it wasn't necessarily medical imaging, but that's what I started to work in. And for the first, I would say, um, uh, 20 years of my working career or so, 15 to 20 years, my solitary goal was how do I make a difference in ultrasound? That was my goal. Uh, how do I make more people use ultrasound for the right reasons? Because uh, I was really fascinated by it and I enjoyed the technology. And so every time I made a move, that was the question. And then as, as I started to do more and more of that, it gradually shifted towards how do I make a difference in healthcare, uh, a broader context, which gives you more variables and more things to think about. But those were the types of questions that I asked myself, that in this new role, can I really uh, achieve that better than where I'm at right now? And if I can, then I moved. It was really as simple as that. Mm -hmm. Did you ever hit a point where you thought, I'm, I, I've derailed my, my upward trajectory. I, I, I've, I've got myself off in a cul-de-sac and, and therefore I'm not going to be able to fulfill my, my ambitions. 
Not really. I mean, I don't know. I, 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 I don't think too hard. <laughs> I, I, um, because the ambitions are so broad, and, and you know, it's not it's not a next year's ambition. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, you can't give up on the first, you know, sort of uh, problem that you face, uh, whatever it is. And um, I've I've always, um, I guess, I've always. Um, uh, kind of uh, gone back and tried to find, you know, what the issues were that were problems at that time when I faced any kind of adversity, and 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 am I really approaching this in the right way? Are the fundamentals right? And if they are, I s- stick to it and say, well, there must be a different way to to solve the problem. Uh, I think a structured approach to this in your own mind helps a lot. And, and a consistent thought process, which, look, I, frankly, I didn't kind of design it or do anything like that. I just, so over time, it just evolved that way. Mm-hmm. I guess my, um, I think my engineering uh, training and then using that in a PhD actually did help because you deal with fairly abstract pro In a PhD, you, 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 gotta, you gotta do something that, is, um, that no one else has done whether it's important or not is secondary, but no one else has done. And you've got to not only uh, demonstrate it empirically, at least in uh, engineering, but you've got to write the theory. And, and the analytical capabilities that one has to build in trying to do that, if you can then apply it to other fields, gives you good training. So I think I was fortunate in, in that sense. Now, I'm not saying everybody in the world has to do a PhD, but in my case, uh, that I think did help. So applying those skills, uh, did, did you ever run into some tension between trying to, to make a difference, to use your skills to make a difference in, in overtime healthcare? And short term. Um, as opposed to making money? I have a fundamental belief that, um, that, that, that value, that if you create value of some sort, that has money associated with it. And if you don't create value, then the money is probably not real. It may seem real, but it's not sustainable. So if the goal is, in the end, to create value, then the money will come. So the real question to, that, that one struggles with is not so much whether I doubted whether you could make money with it or not. The real question is, could you make it in the short term? Because sometimes these things take time. And how do you balance short-term uh, priorities with long-term priorities is a, is a challenge that one always has to go through. And I think that's part of business. And you know, as you do bigger and bigger businesses, you uh, sort of learn more techniques how to do that, but that is essential. You cannot be either only a short term, if you wanna, if, you, if you're running a big business with a, with, with a, with a goal to be enduring, um, and one that always survives, you've gotta always look at both short term and long term. Just long term alone is not enough. You have got investors. You, you've got to, who want results. And at the same time, if you don't think of long-term, you can get disrupted. So you've got to do both. And, uh, and I think um, the way in which we do both is, depends on the particular circumstances, depends on the particular business, but you just cannot run a business without thinking of both all the time. So in addition to, to balancing short-term and long-term, uh, you, you've talked about uh, Medtronic's fourth tenet, yeah. which is yeah. fair profits. Can, yeah. you, can you elaborate uh, a little about? bit on that? Yeah. Well, if you allow me, let me actually run through some of the other tenets because it's good to uh, put that in perspective. Because I do think that the mission of Medtronic, which was written in 1960, uh, and was written at a time by our founder, who actually just recently passed away a few weeks ago. Um, it was written by him and his management team when the company was um, uh, barely less than a, mi- a million dollars in sales with maybe a few hundred employees at most, not making money, and the company had just borrowed money to grow. And, um, and uh, the idea here was to uh, use that money. Uh, his idea of writing a mission was to make sure that uh, people who ran the company used the money that the company had in a responsible way, and he wanted to write that down. And that's where the mission of Medtronic came from. 
uh, and and the and you know the first tenet, which in itself is another one that I think they're all profound, but but there are a few that really stick out. And the first one also sticks out because the first one says that we're a technology company in biomedical engineering, which is a biomedical engineering technology, which makes it fairly specific. But we're a technology company whose goal is to alleviate pain, restore health, or extend life in people around the world. And what that essentially means that we're a technology company with a charter to change outcomes. And, and I think that's important to realize because there are lots of companies who, like a hospital, who will alleviate pain, restore health, and extend life, but they're not technology. And there's technology companies out there who will be satisfied by selling the technology and let someone else move it to an outcome and whether it actually happens or not is secondary. Medtronic does both. And there's all kinds of strategic decisions that result from that. But it's also true that in the end, the value in healthcare is, is uh, indisputable if you actually change an outcome. If you actually alleviate pain, restore health, and extend life, I think anybody, anywhere, will find a way to pay for that. And there is a clear value associated to that, which is not in dispute. And I think that sets, that, that is one piece, that that quest to improve lives is something that never goes away, even 100 years from now, 200 years from now, it will always be there. And engineering, in the same way, technology is going to progress. And our knowledge of the human body is only going to increase. We know very, still know, actually know very little about it. And when you put all of this together, you get a statement which really says that you're an enduring growth company. And, and, and I think that's an important thing to fall back on and, and not drift in some way. Now, there are other tenets, one which says that, you know, the importance of focusing and scaling and not trying too many things. Then there's a tenant which talks about our values of honesty, integrity, dedication, service, quality of our products. I mean, these are, these are pretty standard. And then we come to the fourth tenant, which is the one that we talk about, the fair profit. And, um, and the reason that is, I think, a very striking statement, because let me take you back to where the company was when this mission was written. Less than a million dollars of sales, hardly making money, a few hundred employees in 1960, okay? And uh, you're gonna write a statement about profit so that you can reuse that money to reinvest in other things. Why, did, why was the word fair used? And if you're not making money, I think make a profit is a pretty good goal. <laughs> or short of that, at that point, you're probably gonna say, I'm gonna maximize my profit, which is a more natural thing to put than make a fair profit. And I'm, I don't know if Earl, who's our founder, actually thought about it this way, but in my sort of interpretation of that, that is a very profound statement because what it says is that you have to charge a fair price and you, and you can only succeed if your customers succeed. Because if your customers don't succeed, you won't have any customers. And for your customers to succeed, you have to charge them a price which will be of value to them so that they can make money. And, and therefore, I think the word fair has, has got enormous implications. Now, if you try to make that into a definable business process, then it's very easy to say all of this sort of philosophically. But if you really want to translate that into something that's actionable, you have to start to quantify price. And you have to start to quantify value. And once you start to do that, you have to understand your customer's operation properly. And you've got to understand how they make money. And in our world, in the end, that becomes how the healthcare system makes money because the customer is worried about their customers. And so it leads you very quickly to a point where we come to the conclusion that unless, the, unless we do things that has a line of sight that creates value in healthcare, over the long term, the company will have a problem. And I think this, this fourth tenant defines it. And um, there were times when uh, you could question where in a, in a non, um, in, a, in a fairly sort of a coincidental fashion, we could be exploiting regulation in a way that we just make more money. And, uh, and we, need to, we need to be careful of those or over-treat, over sell products because people want to buy them, whether it's useful or not, but we make money. 
And you've got to be very careful about things like that. Um, so I, I think it, it does give certain guidelines to the company that's, that's extremely important. So speaking of, of value, uh, mm -hmm. there's been this push towards value-based care. Yeah. And uh, the, the thinking that maybe this is finally the way to bend the cost curve. Yeah. Uh, and you've embraced this as yeah. a company in, and you've been willing to price based on value. So yeah. tell me what have been some of the challenges in moving to that model in a world where the incentives for the payers yeah. and the providers may not be completely aligned depending on whether they're value-based or fee-for-service-based? Yeah. Well, I'll start by saying is that we've only moved to that model in very, very few instances because of all the things you state. But I'll tell you also that we've learned a lot about what it takes and what's important and how you do it and who your partners have to be. Um, our desire to move to that state is, resides in the two tenants that I talked about. Our mission states that we have to change outcomes and that we have to charge, make a fair profit. If you put the two things together, value-based healthcare becomes obvious, right? Because value is created when you change outcomes. Our mission states you have to change outcomes at the lowest possible cost. And, and fair profit means you do it so that it's done at the lowest possible cost. And so value-based healthcare is inherent in this company. And in today's world, in the end, it's inherent in all of healthcare. Now, to move towards value-based healthcare, to operationalize it is a whole new suite of challenges. And over the past many years, we've learned that to operationalize value-based healthcare, one has to think about healthcare in a granular fashion, which it is because, you know, a treatment for a cardiac problem is a, and the expertise that's required for a cardiac problem is completely different from, you know, orthopedics or a pain or some other problem like that. In fact, even in cardiology, there's a big difference between what is called interventional cardiology, which looks at the vasculature, or uh, electrophysiology, which looks at the electrical system, and those two disciplines are completely different. And so healthcare is granular. People are different. Uh, you know, a treatment that may apply to a certain person with the same condition may not necessarily apply in the same way to another person. And so it is a granular subject, so you gotta define, you gotta make, understand that. But if you're gonna talk about value-based healthcare, and value-based healthcare really means being paid for increasing the outcome over cost ratio. So, so in other words, you either improve the outcome or you lower the cost or you keep the outcome the same and lower the cost, that's how you create value. And if you're gonna create a business model around that, well, you've gotta start with the first question is can you actually define the outcome? What is the outcome? That's the first question. Second, in a, in a clear fashion, in which you'll actually get paid for. So it can't be some fuzzy thing like people filling forms out. <laughs> it's gotta be measurable. Uh, second is, remember, you're getting paid for an improvement in outcome. So what do you have to do? You have to baseline the current state. So can you retrospectively sort of baseline the outcome both in, in terms of the outcome itself and the cost required to reach that outcome on a retrospective basis. And then can you monitor prospectively the improvement? Only if you can do that, do you have the basis of a model. So you gotta start with that. That can you define the outcome? Can you measure it in an appropriate way so you can see the improvement? The next thing you gotta do is you gotta be granular about, about who the patients are because uh, uh, even for, like I just said earlier, even for a very specific treatment, depending on the condition of a patient, um, you may get a different outcome. You know, you have cardiac surgery on someone who's 80 years old or 60 years old with comorbidities and all the rest. You expect something different and the cost will be different than doing cardiac surgery who's gonna congenital problem or something and is 30 years old. Same cardiac surgery, but the outcome, the expected outcomes will be different. You get less complications and all of other stuff. So the cost will be different. So it's understanding of cohorts is fundamental to value-based healthcare. Who do you treat? And, and, and who, who would you then over-treat or under-treat? And what is the value of that? So an understanding of cohorts and understanding of outcomes in a very quantitative fashion is important for value-based healthcare. And then the third thing, that takes you to a business model is how many variables are there? 
If we have a technology that when applied to a given cohort has a guaranteed outcome and there's no other variables, that means you put the technology in and you get the result, that's the easiest model. But in healthcare, it's not that simple. Usually a doctor puts it in. Sometimes a patient needs to adhere to some medication. Sometimes discharge instructions have to be written correctly. There's all, all kinds of other variables that come into play. And if I'm going to be responsible for an outcome and get paid for it, and there's some doctor who makes a mistake, then you know, I'm not going to pay for that. So the more variables you have, the more complicated the business model becomes. It's solvable, but more complicated. So we started with things with a few variables. Mm -hmm. So that's our approach to value-based healthcare. It, it is a long journey. Then I, you know, I can go into this and talk for the next hour about different trade-offs, which usually probably be too much. But, but all I'm saying here is that there's certain principles to operationalizing, and we're just very early in this journey. But eventually, you know, stakeholders will change. But this is a multi-stakeholder journey. It's not just us. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the lifeblood of, of Medtronic is, is innovation, yes. and that innovation requires quite a bit of R&D yeah. spending and, and fairly long lead times in developing these new products. With this shift to value-based care, do you worry that that puts your basic innovation model at risk in, in terms of your ability to recapture the, those investments? Not really, because in many ways, uh, all our products are not necessarily long cycle. We have short cycle products too, where, where we do uh, incremental innovation. And in many ways, a true move to value-based healthcare, where you actually get paid for the inc incremental innovation, depending on what value you create, is actually better for us. Because today, that's arbitrary. Today, there's no increase in reimbursement for an incremental innovation. So the doctor then has to verbally prove to the administrator that, look, this thing is actually doing something. And the administrator is asking, well, if there's no increase in reimbursement, it's going to cost me more money. Why should I do it? And believe it or not, there are conversations that people have where it says that, so this is going to prevent rehospitalization. Well, that's going to cut my revenue, not increase it. So why should I do it? In a value-based healthcare world, that problem goes away because you get paid for something that the hospital and the healthcare system actually benefits from financially. And so we can price adequately straight away. And so if you move to that place where innovation, which is not paid for today, or we it paid for, but it's highly qualitative, it depends on you know, how well you can kind of make your story and you know, what kind of relationship there is and this kind of stuff, instead of it's, if it's more quantitative, then you know, eventually we'll all move to a state where the quality of our products go up, the value of our products go up, because you're getting clearly paid for that. I think that in itself actually is a benefit to us. And then the longer term programs where we create, invent new markets. I mean, there we go through clinical trials, we have evidence, and we actually get a reimbursement for it because you're creating brand new markets and you're making big differences to people who, who would otherwise die and are now living for 10 years. You know, something like that easily works in a value-based healthcare world as well, but actually it works in the present system too. I think the value-based healthcare approach to things that are not that well defined today is where it has the maximum benefit. Uh, and the long-term programs uh, we're going to do anyway, and then they've got long-term trajectories. Today we're fighting a battle where, and, and we're big enough that we have enough of these coming out. And they have big sort of financial benefit for us for all the right reasons. But we have a drag on our core business if you don't have continued innovation in that core business, which doesn't get rewarded. Mm -hmm. So value-based healthcare will stabilize that core business and perhaps increase it because the engineering that we do gets more efficiently rewarded because we've quantified the value. And if that goes on, then it gives us actually more headroom to work on the, on the real growth areas, which, which, which are in many ways, from that perspective, easier to grow. Of course, a lot more difficult from a technical perspective because you're inventing a new thing and creating a new market. But once you're there, the value is a little easier to kind of portray, if you like. So the, the, the firms that are being uh, celebrated for their level of innovation these days are the tech firms, and mm -hmm. you're a tech firm, you're, mm -hmm. but you're a med tech firm. Mm -hmm. 
So what, what do you think really distinguishes med tech from the, uh, the tech firms that we see in Silicon Valley? Well, the, the, the difference is in med tech, uh, you got to make a difference um, uh, to people's uh, health in a, in a directed fashion. I mean, it's a very clear objective. Uh, and um, you cannot make a mistake. Because if you make a mistake, someone's going to die. Uh, that's not acceptable for anybody. Not us, not the patient, not the healthcare system. Nobody wants that. So the consequences of a mistake are much greater. And so our ability to prove things and stand by them is extremely important. And we have to get regulatory approval. Uh, and, and our payment mechanisms are different. We get paid by payers, who are either private payers or, or, or the government or whoever, but payers. In the tech world, consumers pay. The consumers are, you know, if you buy something and you don't like it, Typically, you just say too bad. <laughs> you know, you know, sometimes you return it, but usually you don't. You just kind of live with it. Uh, in our world, you know, if you don't like it, there are consequences. If a patient doesn't get better, I mean, it, to some degree, there are flaws in our fee-for-service system where actually there are no consequences, but it's costing the healthcare system money by doing that. Uh, but, but I think that's the biggest difference, that the regulation for the right reasons the, uh, the, the sort of results or consequences of a mistake uh, and the preciseness of the value proposition are, are key differences. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, the, the usage of technology uh, tends to be what I call more structured. Uh, we do clinical trials. We're structured. In, we have lots of data when you do clinical trials. We understand statistics, but it's in a very structured way. You know, what are the, uh, where is this data coming from? What patient is it on? How do you use it? It's all structured. Uh, tech companies tend to deal with unstructured data and they, and they make assumptions and with, with stuff that just comes in. Um, and so it, it, is a, it is different. It is different. And in some ways, they can move faster because you don't have the burden, if you like, of proving everything. But there's things that we can learn from them, and we may be too slow. And there's things that we can learn from them, uh, which which uh, which we can which can be additive to what we're doing. You know, behavioral data coupled with clinical data might help us identify diseases more easily than than the way we do it today. So, I mean, this device I have, yeah. uh, my my Apple Watch, yeah. uh, arguably is uh, is med tech. Yeah. Um, are you worried about a company like Apple where mm -hmm. they can take advantage of going direct to consumers and compiling massive amounts of data and, and using big data uh, and data science techniques to, to learn more about potential applications? Do you see them as a threat or a potential collaborator? Mm -hmm. I think much more of a collaborator than a threat because they'd have to... Um, find ways to, uh, in a definable way, change an outcome, not just alert a problem, which may or may not result in an improved outcome. Um, so we can use that capability, be more sort of um, broad-based in, 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 in our selection of cohorts because of that, and then actually do something about it that we can stand up for and sort of, if not guarantee, kind of at least show credible evidence that it works. Um, I, I think to jump between one, one um, sort of environment to another is quite a change. It's a, like we are not a consumer company. We need to understand consumers. We need to understand patients over time and know how to manage them in the right pace so they stay better. But we're not going to go around. We don't know anything about advertising to patients, and that's not our skill set. Uh, they know how to do that. Uh, tech companies know uh, get you know orders of magnitude more data than we do, but it's unstructured. It's behavioral, and they've learned through artificial in intelligence to use them. And so I think they would be much more useful in monitoring certain conditions and when allied to clinical data and clinical structures, we can probably make a difference. 
So that's why I, I'd argue that it's probably more collaborative. Now, you know, tech companies are bigger than us. Uh, they've got, we've got a lot of firepower, but they've got even more firepower. And they could buy a tech, med tech company and find a way to integrate it and do what I'm saying instead of collaboration by owning. Uh, then they do become a threat. And we're going to find another tech company who's not doing that <laughs> and, and figure out how to work with them. Uh -huh. But I don't think they will organically learn what we are doing. Yeah. It has to be. Uh, that's, I mean, they could do it, but it's, it's a major change. Is it possible that, uh, I mean, in your world, a, a lot of, a lot of costs uh, is associated with clinical trials. Is it yeah. possible that with the use of yeah. unstructured data that you can yeah. reduce the costs of yeah, almost these certainly. clinical trials? Uh, yes, uh, almost certainly we can do that. Uh, uh, we can find cohorts more easily. We can, we can engage with the, one of the biggest costs of clinical trial, one of the biggest time in clinical trial is, is patient enrollment. To identify patients in a certain category uh, and find them and enroll them, I'm certain that using behavioral data and the, and, and the analytic capabilities that tech companies have, they can probably find the right patients for enrollment in, in way faster time than we can. First, they can reach more people. Second, through their behavior, they can probably narrow down a likely suite of candidates much more quickly than we can by just going to a hospital and waiting for, you know, asking doctors and primary care physicians who they know manually, essentially. And, and here they are through a massive amount of data, like it or not, knowing what emails they're writing and what they're doing and where they are. I mean, I'm sure you can figure out from that, given a specific type of person to find, their ability to do that is much greater than, than ours. So that's of great help. Mm -hmm. So that alone, patient recruitment alone, can help with clinical trials. Mm -hmm. uh, outcome measurements, follow-up time can be quicker. Uh, so uh, certainly, I mean, that's, that's uh, almost um, one of the first things that we could do. I'm going beyond that. I'm going that just in management of uh, patients after clinical trials. Uh, you know, uh, one, I'll give you an easy example. Uh, people have, uh, there's something called an aortic aneurysm. Okay, in, in your aorta, if you get an aneurysm, that's not a good thing. Now, you can block that aneurysm and you can be cured. And you can do that with certain standardized procedures. If you don't find the aneurysm and it kind of bursts, it's a serious problem and you have a high mortality rate if that happens. Because by the time you show up to the hospital, you can get bleeding and internal bleeding, all kinds of stuff. And, and the mortality is a very risky thing. You don't want to get that. Um, and yet, um, so you have to do screening on asymptomatic patients as to who has a risk of aneurysms and go and do something about it, monitor them in some way. And there are certain sort of procedures outlined that if you're a smoker, you're over 65, then you should get aortic screening through ultrasound. But that's a, that's a recommendation. Uh, and that's all it is. It depends on people going to the primary care office, the doctor knowing about that, actually doing the scanning, and if they find it, know the right thing, and then report it. You have to do all those things, which on paper can be done, but to make that make sure that that actually is done by people at large, not to speak of systems where the healthcare systems don't even exist properly, that's, that's quite a challenge. If through data you could find that people who've had aneurysms blow up have had certain behaviors, have been to the doctor more than twice or have certain things, and I don't know what the answers are, but, but I can imagine that through their view of statistics, looking at behavior for a certain pool of patients, they might be able to find that, look, if you do this, this, and this, this pool has a very high likelihood of this happening. Even though no one's done any scanning or anything, there's a likelihood that this can happen. Then what are they, and can you do something about it? I mean, that's just one. I mean, there are other examples, and this may or may not be possible. I don't know. I'm just taking this up, up as an example because it's one that we've thought about. Uh, there are many other things uh, that, that, that can be applied. Okay. I'm going to shift the conversation to purpose and values. And uh, you said something to me earlier that, that was very interesting, which is people come together at work and, and where under normal circumstances they might be enemies, enemies yeah. that they show up and work together. What, what do you think makes that possible in 
in a work environment that seems so challenging in society? Well, it's a common goal. It's a common goal. And, and then the specific example is, uh, you know, as a global company, uh, we have people from, um, and we're not the only ones, so almost any global company, uh, people from all kinds of ethnicities and uh, you name it, religions and whatnot, and, you know, traditionally enemies working together with no problems at all, absolutely zero issues as friends overnight. <laughs> How does that happen? Because they share a common goal. They'll, they'll get rewarded for the same thing. And when you get rewarded for the same thing, you work with each other. And, and that common goal is what drives this collaboration independent of who you are. You've got competition. Yeah, you've got somebody else trying to fulfill the same goal. That's your competition. It's not your ethnicity. It's another company trying to do the same thing, probably with the same blend of people. And actually, if you can find a bigger blend, you probably have a bigger chance because you have more perspectives. Um, and so I think that is what the fundamental difference is. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a sort of a nationalistic society where, where, where a society gets a benefit for just um, you know, making that country more, or that ethnic group stronger at the expense of somebody else, and that's your competition, and I can imagine you know, all kinds of fights starting. But in our world, it isn't that. It's a common goal which is not where you come from, or who you are, or what race you are. It's what problem you're trying to solve. And I do think that, that if you could harmonize that, that would, uh, that would solve a lot of problems. So you're, you're, you're a global citizen, yeah. and, and you believe in globalism. Tell me some of the challenges that, that you face as a consequence of the rise of nationalism here and in other parts of the world. Well, um, actually, the biggest challenge is that uh, the rules keep changing as a result of that. And, 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 you know, frankly, we're not too idealistic about this kind of stuff. I mean, I, you know, I, I'm not going to live in a world where there aren't any countries and borders that are going to be. And there's going to be competition between borders. You're just going to accept that. You know, I, the fact is that we can hire people and make them work together, but I'm not going to change the world by doing that. At least we can't. We, we just got to do our own thing. So we're going to live in a, in a world where there is nationalism. Either extreme or not, it doesn't matter. There is nationalism. And uh, for us, if the rules are clear, we can work towards that, whatever they are. You just tell me the rules and keep them the same, we'll be fine. We'll figure it out. Now, if the rules change, that makes it very difficult. You know, like, um, you know, one moment global manufacturing is of value, the next moment you penalize everything. And you can't shift your factories from one place to another overnight. And so it takes a long time to establish that. So, so uh, consistent regulation helps us, actually. Um, now. Given that, given the fact that that may or may not always be the case, then we look towards certain facts. And in healthcare, I'll point to um, a couple. You know, first, it's just a fact that healthcare's, a business in healthcare is dependent on the size of a population. The more the people, the bigger your business is going to be. Maybe not today, but eventually. And so for a US-based or a US healthcare company, going outside the US and understanding those markets is critical because more people live outside the US than in the US. And the bigger countries in the end will have the biggest healthcare markets. So I mean, that's a recognition that a healthcare company just has to have if, if you want to be global. That in the long term, your markets outside in other countries, a country like China is going to be the biggest market. And you better know a Chinese, there'll be more Chinese physicians than any other kind of physician in the next 20 years. And if you don't know those Chinese physicians, then how are we going to be successful? And so just that fact that you have to understand that. And the other is realizing that, look, there's going to be conflict. There's going to be conflict with rising powers, and you know, China is going to be a, a threat of some sort. And, and we've got to live in that world. And we've got to win in China. And I know there'll be policies that kind of try to undermine them in some way. Uh, we've got to figure out how to live within that. And then, you know, there are things that we think about, like uh, 
doing a lot of localization in China and, and not taking from the US, but for China itself. We wouldn't do localization in a small country very easily, um, although in healthcare, even in a small country, if you reach real penetration, you get a fairly big market, but China is an extreme end of that. Um, so, you know, you've got to think through things like that. Uh, in, in a world there that's, um, you just got to be pragmatic and principled at the same time and kind of work your way through that. So I'm going to ask you one last question, and then I'm going to turn it over to the audience to, to ask questions, which is, uh, it, in your introduction, the, uh, the acquisition uh, of Covidian was mentioned. Mm -hmm. And so did you get caught up in this debate over globalism versus nationalism uh, with the, the tax inversion that, that was a part oh. of the, the Covidian uh, acquisition? Yeah, I don't know if it was framed as globalism versus nationalism at that time. It was framed as, uh, you know, you're a U.S. company and you're not, not patriotic because you're moving somewhere else. That was, that was the kind of uh, sort of uh, emotional storyline. And um, sure, we got caught up in that. And we thought about that a lot. And in the end, the reason we did the inversion was for the benefit of the U.S., at least as the tax regulation stood at that time. Because what the inversion did is it actually the, the, the tax regulations pertaining to, uh, to what we'd call legacy Medtronic didn't change, didn't change at all, it was the same. All we did was made sure that the tax regulations that applied to the company that we were buying didn't change in a negative way. In a negative way meaning that the cash that they were generating while well, before the acquisition could be used anywhere, including the U.S., without paying any further taxes, if we'd incorporated them in the U.S., we wouldn't have access to that cash anymore. And if we didn't have access to that cash, then that cash, we wouldn't be paying more taxes on it because no one was doing that. It would just be sitting outside the U.S., and the only ones who'd benefit from this would be some banks who were, you know, sort of using their money. And we wouldn't be able to use that cash, and we certainly wouldn't be able to use it in the U.S., and so we felt that that just didn't make any sense. And instead, if we took that cash and invested it in the US in a more aggressive fashion than what Covidian was originally doing, at least under those regulations, it would only benefit the US. And you can say what you want about tax rules and patriotism and all this other stuff, but if I look at, at am I helping the US or not, we could clearly point to the fact that we were. And uh, we knew that this was going to be a subject of controversy, so we said straight up front that we made a commitment that we were going to take, we committed to investing so much incremental money in the U.S. over a 10-year period that we would create so many extra jobs in Minnesota because of this. And we made that commitment, and we had to. And it wasn't made up, it was real, and we followed through on that. We're still in the journey of doing that, but we followed through on that. And we told that same story to everybody, whether they supported us or didn't support us, because that's what it was. That was the strategy. There was no other kind of sort of paintbrush around it or some kind of tweaking or nothing. That's what it was. And I said it as directly as I was just telling you right now to everybody. And, you know, it didn't always, it wasn't always uh, received with applause, but, you know, the story was consistent. And, uh, and at least in our own, we, in our own principles, we felt at that time and still feel that we did the right thing for our employees, for, for our customers, for the U.S. at that point, and for the overall company. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to turn it over to the audience. Questions? Thank you so much for being with us today. I had a question about your experiences when you were young. Are there any defining life moments you had when you were in Bangladesh that shaped your personality and the strategies that you employed when you took over at Medtronic? You mean when I was growing up? Is that what you mean? You know, um, not really. I, <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't, I wasn't uh, you know, I was just growing up as a kid. I didn't think too much about healthcare or anything. You know, I just kind of just grew up. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Uh, I, I think uh, I think I have a um, I have a sense of belonging still. 
And I feel that uh, if I can, I'll make a difference there with what I know and what I can do today. But, uh, you know, I can't really honestly say that looking at the poverty around me made me so principled that I wanted to do something about it. I didn't understand any of that at that time. I was just going to school and playing and doing whatever and saw things around me and thought that that was the world. So, you know, that's the honest answer. It's not as perhaps fabled as it could be, but, but that is the honest answer. <laughs> I mean, to that point, it gave me other experiences which have been a benefit, like uh, learning uh, how to adjust in different societies. And, you know, there were other things that I learned. Uh, that, that is true, that, that growing up, um, you know, the, the, I, I, I went to an English medium school, so I learned English well. Uh, and, um, Did you I, mean to say you learned English good? Or no. <laughs> so uh, I, I uh, um, also the um, you know we moved around quite a bit growing up from place to place. So I learned how to adjust. So there are things like that which I learned certainly. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when I moved to England, when I was um, in my teens, uh, and I spoke English, but culturally it wasn't quite the same. I, I fit in, but but you still learn different things. Uh, so moving around has taught me a lot, but uh, but I'd say just the pure growing up there and looking at poverty and all that. I'm not sure that at that time that had a big impact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, as a fellow Bangladeshi, I feel incredibly proud of what you have accomplished. Yes. And my question is, I mean, you appear incredibly humble um, in your leadership style. How do you cultivate that humility, and how do you? you know, propagate your humility and modesty um, through your leadership at Medtronic? Well, um, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, look, uh, you know, I think Asians in general are taught to be humble. As a, they're just taught, you know. <laughs> uh, you know, you kind of respect your elders. Okay, uh, and you just, you, that's a core value, it just is. Uh, and I think Asians in the audience will, will agree with that, that that's a core value that your parents kind of teach you. And just don't lose it. Um, you know, and I don't know, I mean, I don't think too much about it. I, I just, I just kind of do what I think is right. Uh, I, I think doing what you think is right at all times is important. And that gives you the balance between, because you, if you're so humble that you never ask for anything, that's not good either. Or you never stand up for anything because you're too intimidated. I mean, that, that's not the same thing. Uh, so you, you've, got, you've, got, you've got to have your principles and you've got to stand up for what you believe in. And you've got to push for what you believe in. Uh, and know what's right and stay on that. But, you know, you don't need to brag about everything as well. <laughs> I mean, you, know, you can take credit, but, you know, you can be reasonable about it. Um, I think the other thing is just um, in healthcare, you learn that, uh, you know, very quickly. It's just how little we know and how little we can just do by ourselves. Uh, I think acknowledging that, I mean, in healthcare, it, it really is something that, if you really think about it, and you think if at any time, if any of you have ever even try to understand how the human body works, even the simplest things. It's so mind-boggling how it works and the genius of whatever, however it evolved, and how much we have to learn. It just tells you how little we know. And, and so I think it's just experiences like that uh, which, which teach you that there's a lot more around you than what you are. And just remember those things. And, and I do think that, um, you know, it isn't, you just, just be yourself, okay? Yeah. So you spoke a lot about the changes that you've made have been very impact-driven and working towards your mission, but uh, you also mentioned that you run a public company with shareholders. Yep. So you must face these decisions yes. every day, balancing impact and yep. business, and how do you go about yeah. that? Um, it's not easy. It's not easy. And I'll tell you things like value-based healthcare actually are long-term um, initiatives which I know are important. 
And uh, yet, um, you know, I can't just say that we'll just do value-based healthcare because the current business model in healthcare doesn't support it. And so that is the kind of thing that leads you to think about that. And that's why we actually came to the conclusion that we did how to operationalize value-based healthcare and make it count in today's world. And so we came to that analytical framework about outcomes and cohorts and things that don't have variables. So I think, um, I think you've got to, uh, you, you cannot wave away or, or minimize the importance and the discipline that's required to meet short-term results. I mean, uh, there are times when no one likes it, but there is a certain discipline which, which forces you to be analytical about this stuff. And, um, and then in terms of long-term investment, you know, start analyzing what are the risk levels. If you're gonna make an investment between three things and you can do only one of the three because that's all you can afford, how will you choose the right one? How do you quantify risk levels between technology risk, clinical risk, and market risk? And how do you know where you are on each and how much of an impact each will have? So I think just waving your hand at this stuff or complaining about it is not the right approach. It's uh, really kind of thinking through these things. And um, short-term and long-term is, is a matter of, uh, of when you get a result and how certain you are of the result and over what time period. And I think uh, doing real planning around that, which is quantitative and grounded, is what the trick here is. That uh, you know, long-term work is not just long-term. There are certain accountability associated with it, which may be different from short-term, because there are more unknowns. But that doesn't mean there's no accountability. That means you've got to quantify the unknowns. You've got to frame the unknowns. You've got to retire the risks. And when you retire the risks, things change or risks get bigger. That forces you to drop stuff. So I think uh, analytical framework around strategic planning, which forces you to quantify what you're investing in, and when you expect the result and the risk level of each is extremely important in running a business that has got both short-term, and most businesses have both short-term and long-term. But to approach that in a thoughtful, systematic, consistent way uh, and quantitative as well, I think is very important. Otherwise, it's very easy to blame stuff. I mean, yeah, but, but in the end, you have to do both. Okay. Okay, we, we have time for one more question. I don't want to hog the question. Uh, Medtronic is a very large company. Um, how do you think about growth and how fast uh, would be too fast to grow a large company? Um, do you have enough internal opportunities or will it continue to require larger uh, outside merger activity to get to wherever you want to get to? Well, you know, uh, the beauty of healthcare, like I said right in the beginning, is that in the end, healthcare is a growth industry because the need is always going to be there. The, the, like I said earlier, the quest to improve clinical outcomes is never going to go away. And our ability to use technology to improve that is never going to go away. And if you do those two things, you're going to create value. And, and on top of that, you've got an access problem around the world, which is also pretty big. So in the end, healthcare is a growth opportunity. It's a matter of how you f focus and how you select the growth opportunities at the right time, which also is a bit of the other question. Now. There's certain other principles. First, the way I phrase that, one might almost think that, you know, you can grow a lot organically. It's putting these pieces together and executing. Uh, understanding, uh, you know, what the risk levels are and doing enough of them so that you can balance your risks and from that, with diversification, get a growth level that's, that's reasonable. And if you get better and better at that, go, go into the right markets at the right time and have enough of a spread of high impact areas, you can inch your growth rate up over time. I think the importance of inorganic is, in our world, is really two things. The most important piece of inorganic is that one has to realize that no matter how big you are and how smart you think you are, you're not going to invent everything and you're not going to be right about everything especially in, uh, in technology and innovation where you can have multiple approaches. And like I just mentioned, there's risk levels involved. 
So once you recognize that, you've got to learn how to acquire as well. Now, the earlier you acquire, the better it is, but it's also the higher risk. And so acquisitions have to play a role in a company which has the firepower to do the acquisitions, which we do. And so um, I've got no doubt that this company can and should be a growth company, growth at a certain level. And if you're not, then we're failing in our own strategies because we're not approaching areas which obviously have growth. We're not either inventing the right things or we're not in the right markets or, or we're not tying the two together well enough. So we, it's our responsibility to grow because the opportunity is there. And we've got enough degrees of freedom to be able to do that. In many ways, we've got too many because you can make too many wrong choices. So you're going to learn how to make the right choices. And then inorganic is an additional area through which you can either supplement your growth or you can cover risk, both, both cases. So that, that's the way we think about it, that the size, you know, I mean, look, um, in the last, uh, through this acquisition process of Covidian, which is a big acquisition, which doesn't happen often. I mean, that happens rarely. Um, but we went for a, from a company which was $15 billion growing at about 5% to a company which is $30 billion also growing at actually more than 5%. So that says that, you know, we just doubled the size of our company. We kept the growth rate the same because we went after parallel growth markets and, there was, and we increased our margins at the same time. So that, that uh, in the end, the scale helped us do things more efficiently and because we thought carefully about where we're growing, not cannibalizing each other, we actually kept the growth rates the same and doubled the size of the company. So if I can do that between 15 and 30, we can do it between 30 and 60 and so on. There's, there's no fundamental reason why not, especially in healthcare, because there's no end to this market. It is, there's no, I don't see it maturing. I, I, you know, no one's going to tell me that at some point you'll say, okay, you know, I've lived long enough and that's it. <laughs> You know, and, you know, everyone's going to want to live that little longer, however old it is. And uh, no one's going to say that, uh, you know, I mean, um, going to a hospital uh, uh, and going through this pain, and, and I always have to suffer that. Uh, or, you know, at one time people did surgeries without, without anesthetic. You can't imagine it today, but people did that. And today, you know, we don't even think about it. Maybe soon you'll do, instead of open surgeries, you only make a little dot and we'll think cutting someone's stomach open is, is barbaric. Like we think of doing surgery without anesthesia today. Maybe a hundred years from now, I'm sure people will think that cutting someone open is probably, uh, you know, what were they thinking? How could people live with that? So that's where healthcare is. So in my view, healthcare is a permanent growth opportunity. And it's up to us to make sure that we go in the right areas at the right pace by using analytical methods to be able to execute on that. And you know, all that stuff's easier said than done, but I think it's all possible. Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Shrunk. Uh, please don't give a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for the question.